Hi, welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I want to use this video to have a look at the different sorts of orbits that you can have of a planet that's actually orbiting multiple stars. Now I did a separate video that looked at the orbits of a planet that was going around two stars, so a binary star, and it could be circumbinary, so going around the outside of both of them, or it could just be orbiting one of them. Now we know that there are on planets orbiting more than two stars now. So now we need to have a look at the orbits of a planet around three stars or even more. So to start with, generally, Planets orbit stars. So in the solar system, all of our planets go around the sun. Now it's worth noting actually that this isn't actually always the case. But the vast majority of exoplanets that we find, so these are planets around other stars other than our sun, are orbiting stars, essentially. However, James Webb specifically has discovered lots of what we would classify as free floating or rogue planets that don't have stars. So planets that don't orbit stars do exist, but they are kind of in the minority. So the vast majority of planets were making the assumption that they actually do orbit stars, a bit like our solar system. Now, we've obviously discovered planets orbiting binary stars. So this is where we've got two stars that are orbiting a common center of mass or the Barry center, and then we have a planet in that system as well. So we found quite a lot of those. Now I'd say probably, if you look at the exoplanet archive, which I'm just gonna show you in a little bit, then about 10% of all of the planets been discovered so far are orbiting more than one star, which is quite exciting actually. So no longer are these binary star systems kind of confined to science fiction. They're real, they're out there, and they're not that uncommon. So there are basically two sorts of orbits you can have when you've got a binary star system. So again, this is kind of a bit of a recap of the, the previous video I did before I move on to like three stars and that. But we have these p-type orbits. Now, a p-type orbit is where the planet, so this is the, the, the green orbit there, is going around the outside of both of the stars. So what would we classify as a circumbinary planet? It's going around the outside. That's a p-type orbit. Then we have an s-type orbit. So an s-type orbit, we've still got the same two binary stars, but this time around, the planet is actually orbiting just one of those stars. And then that star is orbiting the common center of mass with the other star. So two very different orbits there. One goes around the outside, one just goes around one of the stars, which then goes around the other star as well. So S and P type are the two types of orbits that you're going to get in a binary star system with a planet, basically. Okay, now the P type are the most stable they can exist kind of long-term stability-wise. So you can actually have those go around the outside and they're relatively happy. You know, they're not going to get massively perturbed. I mean, the condition here is that actually the planet needs to be sufficiently far away from the two stars that they don't receive significant perturbations as the two stars are orbiting, because they'll be orbiting quite fast compared to the planet's orbit. So as long as that planet star distance is around two to four times the star-star distance. So two to four times further away than the distance between the two stars, any greater than that, then they're typically gonna be relatively stable. And you know that's kind of good, because maybe then you could have long-term stability and maybe even a habitable planet as well. Now with the S-type, they are less stable. Because you've got a planet going around one of the stars and then that star, and the other star are orbiting each other, or the common center of mass, that planet receives more significant perturbations. Now, this only really works stability-wise if the two stars are on a fairly wide orbit, So, or if the planet's very close to one of the stars. So if the planet is very close to the star it's orbiting, and then the actual distance between the two stars is quite large, then that can be stable. But if the planet is on a wide orbit, and the stars are kind of close to each other, then it's not gonna be very stable. So the P-type are better than the S-type for stability, but they both can still be stable in certain situations. Now, interestingly, they can both have habitable zones. So a P-type can have a habitable zone, which is where it's far enough away from both stars that you can have liquid water, so it has the right temperature. Same as kind of where Earth is in the solar system. Now, 
Again, I've done a separate video on this, but it isn't going to be symmetric like that. It might be a, a bit of an odd shape or kind of elongated in one direction, depending on the actual the, the general setup. But the point is, they can still have a habitable zone around the outside of both stars where a planet can orbit, it can be stable, and it can be the right temperature to support life. That's kind of quite exciting, actually. Now, S-type can also have a habitable zone, but it only works if there's a fairly large separation between the two stars again, because otherwise you're gonna get enormous fluctuations in the energy reaching the planet. As those two stars go round, the planet goes in between the two stars, you're gonna get a massive change in temperature of that planet. So actually, it's better if the two stars are quite far apart, not close to one another. But they can still have a habitable zone. And again, I've done this uh, symmetric, but in reality, it would be quite elongated and actually the habitable zone would not be equal all the way around because of the way that the stars are working here. Now, stars, or I should say planets, have been found orbiting more than two stars. So here's an example of one here. So you've got K, O, I, 5, A and B and then C. So this is three stars essentially. And then you've got the exoplanet, which is K, O, I, 5, A, B. And that's orbiting the primary star A. So you've essentially got a binary star there. And then you've got a third star orbiting on the outside of that. And then you've got an exoplanet orbiting one of the binary stars. So we know that there are planets orbiting more than two stars, basically. And actually, if you want to go and double check that. Now, depending on when this video comes out, this is all going to completely change because there's planets being discovered all the time. But if you go to the Exoplanet Archive, so if you search for Exoplanet Archive, go to the link there. This is kind of NASA's online archive where you can get access to all of the data for exoplanets. And what I've done, I've highlighted the bit you want to click on. So if you go onto Planetary Systems Composite Data, so if you click on that, it will bring you to something like this here. And it's all of the data for all of the confirmed planets. Now, if we go back again, actually, if you look at the top, there are candidates. So there's 7,372 test project candidates as I made this video, that will obviously change. That means that there are potential planets that haven't been confirmed yet, they need kind of follow-up work or been a, there's been a signal there that might suggest there's a planet. So with this data set here, these are confirmed ones. These are ones that have actually been confirmed to be planets. So, you've got all of the data set there, everything we know about these planets you can get access to, and there's a huge amount of data there. But what I've actually done here is I've filtered by number of stars. So in the third column, you can see I've, I've basically queried it, said, only show me planets orbiting more than two stars. Because I know there's binary stars, but I want to see how many planets are actually orbiting three stars and more. And I've highlighted down at the bottom again, this might change depending on when you actually see this video. But at the point of making this video, there are 73 planets orbiting three or more stars that we have um, detected so far. And that is out of nearly 6,000. So it's not a lot, but that's still a significant amount orbiting three stars, I would say. You know, it's not like that's massively rare. So there are planets orbiting more than three stars. So what sort of orbits can they have? Well, they can still have P-type. So this is where the planet would orbit around the outside. So I've got three stars all orbiting a common center of mass in the center. And then you've got the planet going around the outside. That again would kind of be a P-type one going around the outside of them all. But also you can have a P-type orbit where it goes around the outside of just some of the stars. Now, why would that still be a P-type? Well, this is a, a kind of a, a barycentric orbit. The planet is orbiting the barycenter of the system, which is the center of mass of the system. And those two stars will be orbiting the center of mass. The planet then orbits around that, and then you've got a third star as well. So the, the P-type orbits are basically barycentric orbits, not necessarily going around the outside of all of them. Now that we've added in an extra star, it doesn't always have to go around the outside of all of the stars. It just needs to orbit the, the common center of mass of the whole system. That's the important bit. And then you also have your S-type orbits as well. 
So again, you could have a planet orbiting around just one of those stars, and then all of those stars are orbiting the barycenter or the common centre of mass, and these orbits are not barycentric orbits for the planet, because it's going around one of the stars, which is then going around the barycenter. So it's not, the planet itself is not orbiting the barycenter. So, can they still have habitable zones? Well, yes, actually. So P-type ones, if you're going around the outside of all of those three stars there, you can still have a habitable zone. If it's far enough away, there's not massive fluctuations in the energy from those stars reaching the planet, it can still be habitable and it can still be stable, you know, given some parameters. It can still be habitable. Can P-type? Well, yes, same again. If it's far enough away, there's a good separation between the stars. There's, you're not going to get massive fluctuations in the energy reaching the planet. Again, I've done it symmetric, but in reality, it would be you know, quite asymmetric because as those stars move around, the amount of energy reaching the planet is going to change. But you can still have a habitable zone around an S-type orbit around triple stars. So still very interesting. We can still have a habitable planet around multiple stars. Very interesting. So I've gone back to the Exoplanet Archive again, and this time round, I've gone to look for planets orbiting more than three stars. And if you have a look, there's two. So you've got two planets there orbiting four stars. So this is starting to get quite interesting indeed. Are we going to find planets orbiting more than four stars? Because we have found star systems that have got like six stars in. Have they got planets? We don't know at the moment, but we do have two planets potentially orbiting four stars, which is quite exciting. So what does that mean? Well, if you've got a planet in a system with four stars, there's the potential for it to have never-ending days. There could be parts of its orbit where the entire planet is in daylight. So there's no day and night on, on any part of the planet. It could have chaotic seasons. Just imagine what that would be like to live on that planet. And even more, if it was habitable, that would be very interesting. But I think the point here really is that we're starting to find some very interesting systems at the moment that are no longer confined to science fiction, which I think is actually a really exciting time to be around really. So thank you for watching. If you enjoy the video, find them helpful, then do consider becoming a member of the channel. There's extra videos in the member section, but it also helps support the channel as well. So thank you for watching.